All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, okay, so we're going to flip forward in your book a little bit. We're going to jump to D. And I want to spend this morning, uh, the first half of today, talking about just disturbances in general, disturbances in reacting environments, um, and where they come from, how we can, we can decompose them, how they propagate, how they interact, what the sources for disturbances are. And then um, the second half of this morning, I want to talk about how flames respond to disturbances, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, topic in and of itself. So that has relevance to turbulent combustion, because obviously turbulent combustion is essentially how flames respond to, to turbulence, which is essentially very three-dimensional, very broadband, um, uh, very high degree of freedom, um, vortical disturbances. And or it has relevance to the problem of combustion instabilities, which is how flames respond to acoustic waves. Um, or even has problems to you know certain problems in high-speed flow, where you have flames responding to disturbances in entropy or temperature. Um, so as I'm, I think I'd mentioned this to you before, but the note packet you have in front of you is for a three-day course, not a two-day course. But I just decided to give you the whole shebang uh, so that you could flip through it. So we're not, that's why we didn't have time to get through everything in section C. And we're probably not going to have time to get through everything in section D. But we'll just see, see how this goes. But um, this is pretty canonical, important stuff, whether you're doing experiments or um, computations. And so I, um, I want to spend a lot of time on this particular section. So just as a quick motivation, so I've already mentioned combustion instabilities. These are large amplitude oscillations driven by heat release. And essentially, what you have when you have a combustion instability problem is you have a flame that's inherently sensitive to acoustic waves, and you have a system that has natural acoustic modes, and they're interacting with each other. And so there's, there's a couple issues there, is, is, is how do these disturbances propagate in systems? How do these acoustic disturbances propagate in systems? What is the source of these acoustic disturbances? What happens when they hit boundaries, and so forth? Um, and uh, you know, so this is, you know, like I said, combustion chambers have natural acoustic modes. Pretty much any closed, confined environment has natural acoustic modes. So you know, if you've ever blown over a milk jug or a beer bottle or any kind of closed container, you'll probably notice that there's some tonal character to it. Um, and um, let me put this on presentation mode. Uh, and you know, so this is a, an example. This is blowing over a beer bottle, and you see that tone at 190 hertz. That's what we call a Helmholtz mode. And you see these tones here. These are axial modes, and you see these higher frequency peaks. These are transverse modes, and, and so forth. And um, like I mentioned, one of the key oh, thank you um, reasons of what's going on here is, is that flames are sensitive to disturbances. So this is a, a nice movie. Oopsie. Um, I just practiced doing this before you got here. What do I got to do? I got to sit open width. There it is. Thank you. So this is kind of a neat little movie. It was actually made at Ecole Centrale by Professor Sebastian Kandel. And just a simple laminar Bunsen flame. And they just put a speaker on the inflow. And they pulse the speaker up and down. And um, if you're looking at, at Schlieren, a at color Schlieren precisely. And so in the middle, though, that is the density gradient associated with the flame. And out here on the outside, that's the density gradient associated with the hot plume. The combustion, the hot combustion gas is mixing with just the ambient environment. That's not, an, that's not another flame. Um, and so if there was no, um, no acoustic waves, you know, can you guys see that red dot? Does that work? Okay. Um, if there was no acoustic waves, you'd just see this nice conical Bunsen flame, maybe vibrating a little just because of vibrations in the room. But um, what you see here is the flow is oscillating up and down uh, at 50 hertz in this example. Um, and you see these nice, clean, coherent wrinkles on the flame. Uh, so clearly, the flame is responding. It's, it's sensitive. Um, you can also see that the rate at which the flame is converting reactants to products is oscillating, because if you look at this outside, this is telling you what kind of the volume of products are. And so clearly, the, fl the flame is a volume source, right? The, 
that m dot into a flame equals m dot out, but the volume flow rate out of a flame does not equal volume flow rate in. Volume flow rate out of a flame is five, six, seven times what goes in because of gas expansion. So the flame's this big volume source, and so, so stuff is flowing out of the flame, more volume flow rate's coming out of the flame, and then it's pulsing. And so you can kind of see that it's pulsing um, by just this, this, this thing pulsing here. Um, so anyway, this just shows you how the whole flame is sensitive to acoustic waves, and, and the rate of heat release is oscillating. The rate at which reactants to products are getting generated is oscillating. Um, and uh, while I'm at it, I'll just show you one more fun little video. This just shows you how the whole, um, this is, the, there's a ton of these things on YouTube, by the way. It's called a Rubens tube. Just go to, go to YouTube and type Rubens tube. And, uh, but what I'm just trying to show you here is, is that not only is the flame sensitive to acoustic waves, but in any subsonic system, sound waves are going to go everywhere, right? They're, they're going everywhere. They're not just staying in the combustion chamber. They're going upstream. They're going into your fuel system. They're going into your air system. Uh, and, and the whole thing's just talking. Everybody's talking to everybody else. Um, so anyway, let's see if we can make this work. All right, we're going to need some volume. Feel free to yell if you tell me, see what I should be doing. My speakers are on. Come on. I got to have volume for this. Up here? Here? Change this one? All right, that worked. Let's do a classic physics experiment called the Rubens tube. Now, I really want to bring it down, but it involves open flames, and some people have issues with open flames. So, what we have here is a length of PVC pipe, has about 100 or so holes drilled at half inch increments, got some foil tape to keep it from melting. On this side, we've got a two inch speaker matching the diameter of this two inch tube. On that side, we've got some lab tubing leading to some propane. So, let's fire it up and see what it does. As you can see, we have some nice standing flames, a little bit of oscillation from the vibrations in the hose. Let's throw some sound in there, see what happens. Let's start with a 449 hertz frequency. As you can see, this sets up a standing wave, and we can see, well, the emerging sine curve that represents sound. What happens here is we're having the sound compressing here and not compressing here. The lower pressure here allows more gas to escape into the atmosphere, shaping the sound curve. Now, we change the frequency. We can see each time we set up a standing wave, we get that sine curve. Higher the frequency, the more waves. Now, let's throw some music at this. How about some Dave Rubat? Thank <laughs> you. 
why the flame goes out right there. All right, so that's kind of a fun little, fun little demo that you can all try at home. Um, but yeah, so that just summarizes, you know, how the flame is sensitive to, to sound waves and then just the whole combustor system. So that's, like I said, it's called a Rubens tube. So that's where that video comes, comes from. Um, but again, the, re the reason we care about this stuff is because if you go back to what we talked about yesterday, operational limits. How does the combustor influence where a system can and cannot operate? And these combustion instabilities have been a huge hindrance um, in, um, in uh, development of, um, of combustion systems. So for example, in liquid rockets, you know, the, the biggest uh, thrust engine developed by the United States was the F1 engine. Um, actually, I don't know if this is, is this still true? Is the, this the heavy, oh yeah, because they're smaller. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, the single largest engine. Um, you know, they did 3,200 full-scale tests. These are big, expensive tests, you know, and 2,000 of them were essentially trial and error, trying to deal with these combustion instabilities. Um, and you, get, you just get these enormous oscillations, you know, and whether it's, it's um, uh, liquid rockets or solid rockets or aircraft engines or power plants, you know, you have these confined environments which are sensitive to where you get this acoustic feedback and, and so, you know, that's, a, that's an important motivator for why we're thinking about not just time averages, time average burning rates and time average flame lengths and things like that, which is important, um, or time average NOx production, but we're also interested in fluctuations because those fluctuations um, are important. Um, probably, like I said, probably one of the biggest challenges in developing a, you know, a liquid rocket and developing in a, um, a low NOx system. Okay, so I want to just, so we're going to do some theory now, and I want to, I want to just back up and I want to think about, I want to th um, take the Navier-Stokes equations, I want to take the energy equation, and then what I want to show you is those equations naturally admit certain types of disturbances, all right? And different types of disturbances propagate in different ways, and they're sensitive to different things, and they have different interaction mechanisms. So I want to show you this decomposition. So in order to do this, um, what we're going to start is we're going to make a lot of assumptions, and then we're going to graduate, just to demonstrate some ideas, and we're going to start relaxing all those assumptions. Um, so what I want to do is let's assume that we have a spatially homogeneous background flow. So let's assume that I have a spatially homogeneous means that, um, that, if, there were no, that if I remove the disturbances for a moment, you know, there's no spatial variation in pressure, the velocity is the same everywhere, the density is the same everywhere, and so forth. Um, that's what I mean by spatially homogeneous background flow. So we've got this flow, or it's, it's a pretty simple flow. And now I want to disturb it. I want to add a disturbance to it. I'm going to, you know, hit it with a hammer or something like that, or pulse a laser into it. And, um, and I want to see what happens to those disturbances. And so, like I said, we're going to, we're going to, and, and I'm going to assume that those disturb, that disturbance that I create is really small, all right? And basically what that means is I can linearize the, um, the governing equations. And we'll think about later what happens when those disturbances are not linear, when I can't linearize, or when the background flow is not homogeneous, because obviously combustion flows are defined by being inhomogeneous. You have temperature gradients, you have pressure gradients, and things like that. But in order to get started, we're going to just assume spatially homogeneous. And then um, what we're also going to do is just to keep things from getting too messy, you can see these additional two assumptions. We'll assume calorically perfect. Um, and then also we're going to neglect viscous and uh, thermal transport, which turns out to be a pretty, pretty good approximation, unless we're thinking about really high frequency disturbances. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to just we're going to decompose. So if you think about all our state variables, pressure, density, velocity, I'm going to decompose it into its base quantity, and the base quantity I'm going to call sub naught, and that disturbances, and I'm going to put a subscript one. So by definition, the base quantity is not varying in time because it's, it's, it's what's the background that I'm going to impose a disturbance. But also, because I've assumed homogeneous, it's not a function of x. Okay, so u naught, rho naught, p naught are just numbers. Um, uh, whereas the disturbance is a function of both space and time. And really what I want to do is better understand these space-time dynamics of, of, what they do, of, of these disturbances and also how these interact. How does the pressure interact with the velocity, interact with the density, and so forth. Um, 
How many of you have ever linearized, when I say have linearized something, linearized governing equations? OK. Um, basically, what you do is let's just, um, I don't want to get too hung up on math here. But for example, if we take the continuity equation, and it turns out that first I'm going to rearrange the continuity equation. So uh, top left, top right. Uh, actually, I got a laser pointer today. Um, you know, you basically have you know one on row. Uh, excuse me. You have d rho by dt plus u dot grad rho equals rho del dot u. But I've pulled the rho over to this side. So this is kind of the standard continuity equation, where that equals that, and it basically just says, you know, del dot u is the dilatation. So if del dot u is non-zero, it means the volume, the local volume of the fluid is oscillating. And d rho, capital D is a substantial derivative. So what that means is in a reference frame moving with the flow, I'm watching what's happening to the density. And so, and I, let's, so if I'm watching the density, so it's basically the time rate of change of the density in this um, control volume moving with the flow. And so it's saying that the time rate of change of the density normalized, you know, one on row normalized by the density, is just going to equal how much the volume of the fluid is fluctuating. So that's, that's just the continuity equation, right? It just says that if the volume's changing, the density's changing um, of the fluid. But um, as I will show you, it's a little bit more convenient to actually take um, some of our, our um, state relationships and write the density instead of in terms of the entropy and the pressure. Uh, and so I've just skipped a step, and I've done it. So, but basically, you know, d uh, one on rho d rho will equal one on cp ds minus one on gamma p dp. So I've just so here I've written in terms of the entropy and the pressure. Um, and so the reason this is useful is because in fact I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna skip a step, but, but because of the assumptions I've made, it turns out that ds dt is identically zero because I've neglected molecular transport and I've assumed there's no chemical reaction. So. One of the ways to think about, you can write the energy equation in terms of entropy. And basically, all the sources of entropy, again, DS, uh, the substantial derivative of entropy, ds dt, what you're saying is, all right, in a reference frame moving with the flow, is the entropy changing? And what, are the, what causes entropy to change? Molecular transport causes entropy to change. Chemical reaction causes entropy to change. And if you go back to the previous slide, I said I'm going to neglect those. And um, so ds dt is zero, so that means this term drops, and so I end up with this as my continuity equation, um, which is an interesting relationship between the pressure and the velocity. Um, and then what I can do is I'm going to use that decomposition. So I'm going to say, OK, the pressure is going to equal p naught plus p1. The velocity equals u naught plus u1. Um, so I've, I've done that down here. Um, and remember, I've said that u, all the base variables are homogeneous, so del dot u naught is zero. So I've already dropped that over on the right-hand side. So I only have del dot u1. And then I've kept everyone else. And then what I'm going to do is when you linearize, basic, what you would do when you linearize is you neglect products of disturbances. So notice, for example, this term right here, I have u naught dot grad p1, and I have u1 dot grad p1. So I've already said I'm going to assume that these disturbances are really small relative to the base quantity. So what that's going to mean is it's going to mean that term is going to be a whole lot smaller than that term. Um, and so I'm only going to hang on to terms that are what we call first order in disturbance. So, if a so I'm going to only keep the u naught dot grad p1 term. I'm going to neglect that term. And similarly, I can linearize this term, and this, that'll just be 1 on gamma p naught times p1 by d pt. And um, you can, in my... Uh, Textbook, you'll, we go through this in a lot more detail. Um, so, um, what you end up with then is when all the dust settles, is you end up with this kind, like the continuity equation becomes something that looks like this: negative one over gamma p naught times the substantial derivative of p one equals del dot u one. And by the way, I've defined. Um, d naught here is the substantial derivative in a reference frame moving with the base flow. So remember, uh, the substantial derivative is the time rate of change of something in a reference frame moving with the flow. d naught, what that means is I'm in a reference frame moving with the base flow. So I'm moving with the base flow, constant velocity, and I'm asking, what's the time rate of change? If I have a pressure sensor, 
What's the time rate of change of that, that pressure that I'm reading is what this um, left-hand side is. And that's equal to the fluctuating divergence. So, and this quantity is important enough that I'm going to give it its own, um, its own um, symbol, and I'm going to call it lambda. And lambda, or del dot u1, has to do with the non-zero divergence, or the fluctuating velocity, of volume. Okay, so as we're going to talk about disturbance propagation, one of the things that we're going to find out is one of the canonical ways in which disturbances propagate is via acoustic waves. And acoustic waves are intrinsically dilatational disturbances. They're disturbances where the volume of the fluid is fluctuating. Whereas all the other disturbance modes, the volume of the fluid stays constant. They're, inco they're essentially incompressible, whereas acoustic waves are inherently compressible. Um, Anyone have any questions? Okay, so we can go through that same process, that same linearized process, and before, rather than doing that on the full three-dimensional um, uh, energy equation and Euler equation, I want to just show you a motivating model problem in 1D, okay? So I'm going to assume that all my disturbances only vary in the x direction. So all my spatial derivatives, all my divergent del dots just become d by dx, okay? Um, and so, for example, the continuity equation, actually here I've written in a, a different way, but to, I've, I've written it in sort of the classic way, but, you know, the continuity equation, you only have, you have d rho 1 by dx, you have d u x 1 by dx. And by the way, u sub x denotes the x component of the velocity, and then u sub y denotes the y component of the velocity. So note I haven't assumed that the, that the, the velocity can have both an x and a y direction. I've just assumed that it's only varying in the x direction. So for example, du y1 only is varying in the x direction. So anyway, so I take the continuity equation. There is my linearized equation. And notice the subscript 1 only shows up in one spot in each equation, because I've dumped all those nonlinear terms. Um, here is my inviscid x momentum equation, which is just a balance between, you know, the, uh, the um, momentum flux, the, the, the momentum flux of, of, the, of ux1 uh, balanced against the, the, the pressure gradient or the force. So this is basically force. This is equal to acceleration. So it's just Newton's second law, f equals ma. Uh, here's my, my y momentum equation. Notice the right-hand side is zero here because dp1 doesn't vary with y, um, so that's zero. So this is just purely a convection equation for ui1. Then I have my energy equation, which I've written in this way, which relates the, the fluctuating pressure and the fluctuating velocity. This might be a different way than you're used to seeing the energy, but you can actually use some different thermodynamic relationships. Um, so what I have here is I have my unknowns are rho1, ux1, P1, UI1, like essentially have four unknowns, and I have four equations, so I can solve this thing. Um, but I'm going to do one more thing before I do that, and I'm going to assume a solution form. So rather than assume that these disturbances have an arbitrary time variation, I'm going to assume that the disturbances are varying harmonically in time, so a sine omega t. So the time dependence of all my fluctuations are sine omega t. And so because of that, I'm going to use complex notation. So I'm going to assume that I can write all my quantities, for example, rho 1 of x and t, I'm going to write it as rho 1 hat, which will be the, the um, which is a function of now x and omega times e to the minus i omega t. So actually, I I've, I've, haven't written it here, but it's, in reality, it's the real part of that would be rho 1 of x and t. And the same with all my quantities. So the hatted quantity, then, is the complex spatial dependence, which is a function of the, the specific frequency. Um, so that's my assumed solution form. So I can plug that in to all those equations. And the nice thing, oh, and by the way, I'm also, I haven't talked about it, but I'm also going to be looking at what the temperature does. Uh, I don't need to solve in a, a, a partial differential equation for the temperature. Once I know the fluctuating pressure and density, I can use the perfect gas equation. I'm also going to solve for omega. Omega is the vorticity. I don't need to solve a separate equation for vorticity. Once I know ux1 and ui1, I know the vorticity. Um, same with the entropy. I'm also going to solve for the entropy. Um, 
But now when I substitute these equations, these, this assumed solution form into those equations, those equations before were, were uh, four um, uh, first order in space, first order in time, partial differential equations. And so I lose the spatial, the temporal dependence. Notice the temporal dependence just becomes, you know, a time derivative just becomes minus i omega times the, uh, the hatted quantity. So I end up going to a system of ordinary differential equations. So in essence, I get four ODEs for four unknowns. And those unknowns are rho one hat, p one hat, ux one hat, and uy one hat. Um, does anyone have a question about what I'm doing? And again, what I'm just going to say is, okay, these are the, this is the natural space-time dynamics that the, that the equations that we're all very used to solving or thinking about, um, the Navier-Stokes equations and the energy equations. How do these equations propagate? What do they do to a disturbance if you put the disturbance into the flow? That's really what we're asking ourselves. And in particular, if that disturbance is time harmonic for what we're doing here. All right. So I skipped a bunch of steps, and I'm going to show you the solution. And I'm going to show you the solution in in matrix form. And what I've done, in addition to, remember, we're trying to solve for p1 hat, rho 1 hat, ux1 hat, and uy1 hat. But just for fun, what I've also thrown in here are the solutions for the fluctuating temperature. And remember, I can get the fluctuating temperature from p1 and rho 1. Also, the fluctuating entropy, that's S, uh, which I can also get from pressure and density. Uh, the fluctuating vorticity, which is omega and also the fluctuating volume of the fluid, which is lambda, all right? And um, because I have four unknowns, basically I just get, it's, it's going to basically be these different coefficients in this matrix times these four terms. So, and I have essentially a, an amplitude, A, P, B, P, A, S, A, omega, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then they're multiplied by this, this term right here, which and notice we have these two bottom terms are e to the i omega x over ux naught. I have the same form. And then this term has e to the i omega x over c plus ux. And this is e to the minus i omega x over c minus ux naught. Um, now, uh, let's real quick, you think there's a chance that I can write on this board? All right, how do I move the screen up? Bingo, okay. Let me just real quick make sure you know how to physically interpret those terms. Um, and to illustrate, Let me do an example. So can you read that with the lighting? OK. So remember, I just said, hey, rho 1 of x and t, I'm going to write it as rho 1 hat times e to the minus i omega t. I didn't, in reality, because it's complex notation, I have to take the real part. I didn't do that, but reminder of that. And now notice that all these solution forms here, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write real now, but just, just assume that re real is there. Remember that these terms had the form of, one of the forms was like, um, I'm just going to pull something up here. One of the solution forms on the right was e to the i omega x over u x naught. I'm going to need to write this bigger, aren't I? I need to be bigger. OK. All right, I'll try, I'll, next time I write, I'll write bigger. Times e to the minus i omega t. OK? So let's just say, what's going on here? Uh, Let's just rewrite this. This is e to the minus i omega t minus u, whoops, x over u x naught. That's what that, that's another way to think about that. So wherever you see e to the i omega x over u x naught, just remember everything's getting, that the actual time dependence is getting multiplied by e to the minus i omega t. 
So if I loop, if I group those, this tells me how that disturbance evolves in space and time. And it's really simple. It evolves as t minus x over u naught. Does anyone have a physical interpretation? When you have a disturbance that evolves like that, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, so what this means is, if I am moving at a speed of ux naught, so let's suppose ux is going that way. If I'm moving at a speed, if, if, if my spatial dependence, if I'm moving at ux naught, the disturbance has a constant amplitude, right? So t minus x on u x naught will be constant if I'm moving as in the direction of the flow at a speed of u x naught. So, um, so in other words, if x, if x equals u x naught times t, which is essentially if I'm moving with the flow at a speed of u x naught, notice that that quantity is a constant. So what that says is, whenever you see that disturbance, what that means, that functional form, it means that the quantity is constant if I'm moving with the flow. Really simple, right? Now, on the other hand, if I'm fi at a fixed spatial location, chink, x is fixed, um, it's oscillating in time as, e to the, as sine omega t. And if I'm at another x location, it's also oscillating in time, but it has a different phase. So I, you know, if I'm measuring the density, the density is going up and down. Over here, but over here, it's also going up and down, but it's phase shifted. It's not exactly, it's not, the peak is not exactly the same amount of time. And the reason for the phase shift is it takes a certain amount of time for the disturbance to get from here to here. Um, okay, so remember going back is there were two terms that he had e to the i omega x over u x naught. So what that means is those are disturbances that are just carried by the flow. They don't change in amplitude. They don't change that they're just swept along by the flow. So those two bottom terms are so it says that those quantities, if you, push a if you put a disturbance in the flow, that disturbance is just going to get washed downstream with the flow at constant amplitude. Anyone have a question about that? All right, there's another class of, of um, disturbances which look a little bit different. So let's look at that one. Can you read by right in the, where the lighting is? Or do I need to go down here? So I'm going to try to write a little bit bigger. Um, you also have e to the, let's see if I can do this on the fly here. You had a disturbance that looks like e to the minus i omega t times e to the i omega x over u x naught plus c naught. OK, c naught here is the speed of sound. All right, so let's put this thing together. This is e to the minus i omega t minus x over u x naught plus c naught. So don't people at Princeton know that blackboards went out about 50 years ago, and there's these wonderful things called whiteboards? Um, I don't know if you can read that. But OK, um, there it is. So now we have a different functional form. What's that? What, what kind of disturbance is this? Hint, this is a disturbance that moves at a, at, at a speed of ux naught. This is a disturbance. It moves at a speed of ux naught plus c naught, right? So in a reference frame, moving at the speed of the flow plus the speed of sound, it's constant. So for example, one of the things we'll see is the fluctuating pressure has this term. So what this means is, if I have my pressure transducer and it's zinging along at C naught plus UX naught, I'll, I'll read constant pressure. Whereas, if I'm at a fixed location, the pressure is going to be oscillating. So what this is, is that is a sound wave, right? Sound waves move at the speed of sound. But, um, but it turns out that sound waves are also convected by the flow. So they move at a speed of C plus whatever the, the flow velocity is. And so, what this also is, though, I just want to emphasize, this is a disturbance that's moving in the positive x direction at a speed of ux naught plus c naught. So I'm assuming that the flow is going in the positive x direction. This is a disturbance that's moving in the positive x direction. Which leaves me now with the last kind of disturbance that we had there, which was e to the minus i omega t 
Now, that last term has a minus sign in the front of it. All the other ones don't. So this one's flipped. So instead of being minus, it's plus x over u, uh, uh, c naught, sorry. c naught minus u x naught. OK? So two things are different about this one. I have a plus instead of a minus, and I have a minus there. What's this thing? Well, it's a disturbance moving at a speed of c naught minus u x naught, and it's going in the opposite direction. Right? So now I have to be in a reference frame where t plus x, where, where that's constant for it to be constant. So this describes a sound wave that's shooting up the flow. Going, and, and, but because the flow the flow is coming this way at a speed of u naught, the sound waves move at speed of c naught. So it's moving in a uh, lab frame at a speed of c naught minus u naught. Right? So what this tells us then is we basically have, so let me uh, put my screen back down. Just as a, so that's, that is our quick interpretive um, guide. to these four basis functions. So I'm going to be able to write all these different disturbances as superpositions of these four functions. But notice I got three different types of disturbances. These two move with the flow, and they're just carried along by the flow. That one moves in the direction of the flow at a speed of c plus u. That one moves against the flow in the direction of c minus u. Right? So I can write. In, in a world of, of small amplitude disturbances, those are, that's, what, that's what happens. I got disturbances moving with the flow, disturbances moving at the speed of sound in the direction of the flow, disturbances moving at the speed of sound in the opposite direction of the flow. That's what I got. So let's, um, let's take a look. Let's start with the pressure. We're not going to go in order. The pressure, OK? P1. What does the pressure look like? So I see 1, 1, 0, 0. So what that means, the pressure is only is a superposition of this term and that term. Okay? It's not affected by this term or that term. Okay? So what is the pressure? Now you see why I give the A as the subscript. Or you, I gave the subscript P and P. The, the pressure, I can write any arbitrary pressure field as a superposition of a sound wave moving to the right and a sound wave moving to the left, is what that's saying. Um, the pressure doesn't have any component that's moving with the flow. Pressure disturbances propagate with the speed of sound, upstream and downstream. OK, that tells me what AP and BP are. They're basically associated with pressure, pressure disturbances. Notice the only other place that has zero, two zeros on the right is the dilatation, lambda 1. So what that's also telling me is Disturbances in volume, or these incompressible disturbances, they're moving. As soon as you perturb the volume of a fluid, you create a wave that moves at the speed of sound. If you perturb the volume of a fluid, it doesn't just convect along. It goes zinging along at the speed of sound. Okay. So the pressure, the pressure field and the dilatation field are one-to-one -one related. OK, let's look at this term right here. Let's, let's try to find a term that's only where this is the only sh one that shows up. And that is this one right here, which is S1. Notice S1 is 0, 0, non 0, 0. So that is why I gave it a subscript S. That if you create a disturbance in the flow that causes the local entropy to oscillate, that disturbance in entropy is, is going to convect along with the flow. So entropy disturbances, you could. You could change the chemical composition of the fluid. You could change its temperature locally. You know, if I maybe I took a laser and I zapped part of the fluid so the temperature elevated, I'd see that dis temperature disturbance just convecting downstream with the, the, or at least the entropic part of that disturbance moving downstream. So that's why I call this this thing right here. Whoever's multiplied by this, it's intrinsically associated with the fl the, the fluid's entropy being oscillating. All right. 
OK, just to round this exercise out, let's find who is the only term that's multiplying this one. That's here, 0, 0, 0, non-zero. And that is that one right there, omega 1, which is the fluctuating vorticity, which is why I gave it a subscript omega. All right, so what that means is um, vortical disturbances, fluctuations in vorticity, are convected by the flow. So in other words, if I did something where I could make the flow locally spin, what's going to happen next if I just, you know, if I stick my hand in there and I spin it and I just then step away and I say, what happens to that disturbance I just created? It just convects downstream with the flow. Um, all right, so now we know what these different things are. They're pressure or dilatational disturbances moving at the speed of sound, and they can go in both directions. And there are entropy disturbances moving with the flow, vorticity disturbances moving with the flow. So with that as a background, we can now take a look at some of the other disturbances. So we already looked at pressure. Let's look at the density. And notice the density actually non-zero, 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 zero. What does that mean? Um, that means the fluctuating density it has contributions from two parts, fluctuations in volume and fluctuations in entropy. So if I have an entropy, if I had a, if I had a probe where I'm measuring the fluctuating density at a given point in the flow, and I'm watching the density bouncing around, oscillating, or if you have, you're doing CFD, what that means is that local density fluctuation you're measuring is a superposition of sound waves that are zinging up, upstream, sound waves zinging downstream, and entropy disturbances that are convecting along. Okay, uh, let's look at temperature. That's this one. Temperature actually is the same as density. Non-zero, 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 zero. Same thing. If I'm looking at what's, if I'm measuring the fluctuating temperature at a given point, you know, I got a, a thermocouple and it's oscillating, it means that what I'm measuring could actually be thought of as a superposition of three different types of disturbances. Sound waves shooting upstream, sound waves shooting downstream, and a convecting uh, entropy disturbance. And you actually don't know what, what it is from just, if you're just measuring the temperature or the density at a given point, you don't know what the amplitude of each of these waves are. You need additional info. But it tells you something about what's going on. Um, OK, let's look at ux. ux is non-zero, non-zero, zero, zero. Um, and by the way, I have to say that for this problem, you can learn a lot, but you have to be really be a little bit careful about the velocity because of my assumptions of 1D. But in essence, what this is telling you is that the, um, the, that acoustic wave that's shooting upstream and downstream is creating velocity disturbances. OK? Um, now, if we go to UY, notice it's 0, 0, 0, non 0, and that's the vorticity. And so, what that's saying is vortical disturbances also create, cause the fluid to, to um, the, the fluid velocity to oscillate. And so let me, just, let me just back up. In reality, it's not that the acoustic waves only affect ux and vorticity only affects uy. That's a relic of this 1D problem. What, so taken, what you should take away from this and actually make a note of this is what this tells you is that the fluctuating velocity is affected by acoustic waves and vortical disturbances. So if you're measuring the velocity, like you're making PIV measurements or a hot wire measurement at a point, that velocity fluctuation is a superposition of sound waves shooting upstream, shooting downstream, and vorticity disturbances that are convecting downstream. Um, and I think that gets us through. We've already talked about all of these. OK? Um, anyone have a question? So this is an enormously helpful interpretive principle for making sense of complicated space-time disturbance fields. Like if you're doing LES or DNS and you're trying to unpack stuff, um, things can get really complicated really fast if you're trying to look at this. But this, using this as a mental model that, okay, I got sound waves and sound waves are going everywhere. And then I got vort vortical and entropy disturbances. They're moving with the flow. And so, and then these, essentially these sound, so I have Acoustic disturbances, vortical disturbances, and entropy disturbances, and then they manifest themselves in different ways in the temperature and the density and the pressure and the velocity and so forth. Um, OK, so that is the 1D problem. Now let's bring it back to the general 3D world. And if you make, if, if you go back to your governing equations, if you go to the um, 
momentum equation and the energy equation. I'm going to skip the steps. But you can actually derive these equations. Uh, for example, if you take the vorticity equation, you know, if you combine the, moment, the momentum equation into a vorticity equation, you, know, you assume that uh, you know, if you linearize it and assume that the base quantities don't vary in space, it turns out that all the terms on the right-hand side are 0. Uh, the acoustic equation, the wave equation becomes this. And then, as we already talked about, the entropy equation becomes that. So you can actually see the same basic idea here, is that the, the, the energy in Navier-Stokes equations naturally admit these three types of disturbances. Vortical disturbances that move with the flow, entropy disturbances that move with the flow, and acoustic disturbances that propagate as sound waves. All right, because remember, that, that substantial derivative here, equation 227 and 218, these describe disturbances that stay constant in a reference frame moving with the flow. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the long and short of it, is that the, the equations that we have admit these three types of disturbances, acoustic, vortical, entropy. We sometimes call these canonical disturbance modes. And then those acoustic, vortical, and entropy disturbances manifest themselves. Those are usually not measurable, right? It's hard to measure the entropy. But I can measure the density. I can measure the pressure. I can measure the temperature. But that entropy disturbance, which is really what's driving everything, is, is manifesting itself in whatever the pressure or the density or the temperature are doing. Um, so and then what I'm going to do now is just expand on this. So, so this naturally suggests a decomposition. It suggests that I can decompose every variable as a sum of an acoustic, a vortical, and an entropy part. So for example, I can write the pressure as P1 as a sum of essentially an acoustic part. And, and here I've given that the acoustic is the, uh, remember acoustic is dilatational. So this lambda denotes a dilatational part. So I can summarize it as a dilatational or acoustic, an entropic, and a vortical part. Um, or the entropy fluctuation, I can write it as an acoustic, entropic and vortical. So, and, or the vortical as an acoustic, entropic, and vortical. So for example, this omega 1s would be vorticity fluctuations induced by entropy fluctuations. Um, so I can, I can just think about every different thing as being a sum of these three kinds of disturbance modes. So let's just summarize them, what, they're, uh, what the, these, these look like. So in the linear, when again, I want to go back to, this is in a world where background flow is homogeneous, where Everything's linear. Um, in that case, if I think about, OK, well, how does, this, how does this vorticity mode manifest itself? Well, it manifests itself as vortical disturbance. This is an equation for vorticity. This is an equation for velocity. It manifests itself as vorticity and, oscillation, vorticity and velocity oscillations that move with the flow. Um, but all these terms are 0. So somebody tell me, what, give me a physical interpretation. What does P1 omega equals 0 mean? Yes, thank you. So that vertical disturbance is convecting along. It's doing its own thing. It's non-zero. If I had a pressure disturb probe, I wouldn't measure pressure fluctuation. It induces no pressure fluctuation. So you get the idea. That one, S1 omega, let's just let's go on a roll here. What's that mean? Doesn't change the entropy either, right? So that vortical disturbance is convecting along. It's not changing the entropy locally. Um, and it doesn't change the temperature. It doesn't change the density. And really what the, the overall moral of the story is here is, is that these vortical disturbances are incompressible. They don't change the volume of the fluid. So they don't affect any thermodynamic quantities. They don't change its volume. They don't change its pressure, its density, its temperature, and therefore its entropy. Um, a quick question for you. Um, if you take a turbulent jet and you take a pressure sensor, um, you're going to measure a lot of pressure fluctuations. That says P1 omega equals 0. So how do you? Um, how do you uh, bring those two observations together? Has anyone, or has anyone taken an aeroacoustics class? So aeroacoustics is basically a really interesting field. It's how turbulence generates sound. Like, why do jet engines make so much blasted sound? Um, 
So this says, and sound is pressure fluctuation. So this says P1, the pressure fluctuation induced by vortical disturbances is zero. But we all know if you stand next to a jet engine, it'll blow your ear out. And that's basically vortical disturbances, tur turbulence making sound. So how do I put those two observations together? It all goes back just to say, what were my assumptions? And what were my assumptions? Look at that top bullet. Um, so I assumed really, really small disturbances here. And the problem of aeroacoustics is, I just said it blew your ear out, right? That kind of might tell you the disturbances aren't small. So that would be, I'd have to keep the nonlinear terms to understand jet noise. And that was really, there's a guy, University of Cambridge professor named Lighthill. Some of you may have heard of Lighthill's equation. That was kind of his innovation, was recognizing that it was this, this um, nonlinear interaction of vortical disturbances that, that led to sound generation. Um, but anyway, to just, so just a reminder, this is all subject to the assumptions that we've made. We're going to start with lots of real world problems we can understand by relaxing these assumptions, but this just kind of gets us started. Uh, okay, so acoustic disturbances now. So acoustic disturbances, so this first equation just tells us that pressure fluctuations propagate as sound waves. Uh, what does this say? Somebody give me an interpretation of equation 233, starting here. Correct. So as that acoustic wave is zinging by, it's not causing any, any uh, vorticity in the flow. Uh, it's changing the volume of the fluid. It's not changing its rotation. And one of the interesting things, this is a really interesting way to think about fluid motion and whatnot, because you may have, like in your intro to fluids class, you may have done some of these decompositions where you can, you know, you can shear a flow or you can spin a flow or you can change its volume. It tells you that, in fact, it's kind of that you can have kinetic energy in the form of fluctuations in volume of a fluid. You can have kinetic energy in the form of rotations in the fluid. But it's actually hard for energy to move back and forth between those two modes, is that however you deposit that kinetic energy into the flow, if it's a fluctuation in volume, it's really hard for that, that energy to get put into vorticity. And in the same way, if you inject that energy into a vortical disturbance, it's hard for that to get converted into a fluctuation in volume. So all kinetic energy is not created equal. You can have kinetic energy, or, you know, uh, fluctuations in kinetic energy associated with changes in volume and fluid rotation. And it's really hard for that energy to move back and forth between those two types of things. So something outside of, we have to relax some of our assumptions to understand how energy moves back and forth between fluid rotation and fluid volume is, is the, the takeaway. What this also says, the, the um, and that, by the way, that's a pretty important observation. Uh, to understand a lot about combustion, a lot about how combustion interacts with, with just uh, compressional flow fields. Um, what that equation right there, it says, again, same idea. That as these sound waves are zinging by, they don't change the entropy of the fluid. The entropy of the fluid stays constant. And that's just because sound waves are isentropic. Um, OK, let's look at this one, 234. What does that say? That says that sound waves are accompanied by algebraically related fluctuations in density and temperature. So fluctuations in pressure, density, and temperature, they all go together. Uh, but they're algebraically related. They're not related by a partial differential equation or an or ordinary differential equation. So if I know what the pressure is, I can figure out immediately what the density is or immediately what the temperature is. So these these. These, and that's due to the dilatational nature of these disturbances, that pressure fluctuations are inherently volumetric fluctuations, and so they cause the density and the temperature of the fluid to oscillate in the same way. And if you wanted to figure out where does this come from, you can just go to the isentropic relation, like, you know, like, you know, P equals times, you know, the general isentropic relationship between pressure and density is, you know, pressure is equal to a constant times rho to the gamma. So if you were to linearize that, if you were to assume really small fluctuations in pressure and density, out would pop that equation right there. 
or the same thing if you took your isentropic relations for temperature. Um, equation 235, that relates how these dilatational and pressure fluctuations relate to the velocity. Now, notice that this is a partial differential equation. So if you know the pressure, you don't know the velocity. And why is that? It's because velocity fluctuations don't care about pressure. They care about pressure gradients, right? Remember, force equals mass times acceleration. So what is force? Forces are created on fluids when you have pressure gradients. You've got to have pressure gradients. That's that thing on the right. So it's not the pressure fluctuation that drives uh, the flow. It's the um, pressure gradient. And similarly, the pressure is not proportional to the velocity. The pressure gradient is not proportional to the velocity, right? Force does not equal mass times velocity. Force equals mass times acceleration. And so the left-hand side, it's not the, the velocity is not proportional to the pressure gradient. The acceleration, the, the time derivative of the velocity is proportional to the acceleration. So anyway, it just shows you how this stuff, some things are related through algebraically. Some, some of these quantities are related through partial differential equations. Um, OK. And then just to round this out, uh, let's see, what time do we go? Oh, we're supposed to be. Well, we'll let, let me do this slide, and we'll take a break. Um, we'll round this out with oscillations associated with the entropy mode. And so let's just look at these. I think we, we know enough now to say what this means. So, so, for, so for example, P1S equals 0. What that means is I have this entropy disturbance. Well, again, let me, so the example I gave before was I said, let's take a laser and let's create a, a local hot spot in the fluid. Well, what happens to that hot spot in the fluid? It convex downstream. That's an entropy disturbance. But if I have a pressure sensor and I watch that hot spot go by, I'm not going to be able to measure it via a pressure sensor because P1S is 0. It's also not creating any vorticity fluctuation. It's also not inducing any flow. But that entropy disturbance does cause the density to oscillate and the um, temperature to oscillate. Um, and by the way, this is sometimes, sometimes people get confused about this because they think that a density disturb, if the density is oscillating, that means that the fluid is not incompressible. You can have an have a incompressible fluid where the density is um, oscillating. Uh, remember, because what's happening is, um, so again, we have to differentiate between Eulerian and Lagrangian reference frames, right? So I'm parked here. I'm measuring the density. The density can oscillate. If it's incompressible, that what it means is if I'm following the flow, the density is constant, right? So if I got packets of fluid where the density here is row one, and here it's row two, and here it's row three, if, I'm, if I have a density sensor right here, I'm going to watch these go by. I'm going to see row three, then row two, then row one. Density's changing. Whereas I'm, if I'm following each one in a Lagrangian reference frame, it's constant. So that's the key difference here. Is, is that, and that's, a, that's something that trips people up all the time, is they think, oh, density's oscillating. It's got to be compressible. Nope, you can have an in, in, de, entropy disturbances are incompressible. Um, Okay, when we take a quick break, uh, we will reconvene, I guess, at five after.